belong here We got no flowers to grow But it feels so good when you want me Baby, I feel so good when you know When you know
Hello. Hello, 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 internet. Welcome to the first ND Unit podcast, if that's if that's what we're calling it now. Um, I'm not on the chat for this stream. West is hidden in the background, moderating the chat and making sure everything's going all right. And he's going to be picking a few questions to answer at the end of the stream. Um, so first of all, if you don't know who I am, I'm Seb. I play bass in Neck Deep now. Um, I'm Ben's brother, the singer of Neck Deep. I'm his older brother. Um, joined ND. When did I join? Officially, I guess, like the start of this year. But if you don't know who I am, um, I did Rain in July with the band. Always written with them. Always pre-proed and studio and all that kind of stuff. So I probably know you guys through stalking their social media better than you probably know me. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do something like this for a while. Um, and now finally the opportunity has presented itself to do it here. And I'm really excited about our first guest and to launch it off with this one. Um, got a bunch of interesting guests lined up already. People who work closely with Neck Deep behind the scenes, uh, friends from other bands, producers, booking agents, managers. Um, but we basically want to make this like an industry hour type vibe. So this podcast or series or whatever you want to call it is going to be really beneficial for musicians and artists and bands. Um, that's who I, who I want to try and get to benefit from these, from these talks that we have, but we still want to keep it ND focused, uh, by talking to other members of the band or our team or friends of the band and anyone that can really add a valuable insight into the inner workings of how bands work and how you make records and how shows get booked and how you use social media. And yeah, if, even if you're not a musician, um, I think you'll find it really interesting regardless. So as I'm sure you already know, if you follow us on social media, uh, our first guest is the legend that is Matt Squire. If you don't know who Matt is, you're going to find out over the next hour or so. Uh, we'll probably do like 40, 45 minutes, then we'll get West in and take some questions from the chat. And I've got a couple questions too um, from people who've asked me questions. But um, if you don't know who Matt is, yeah, you'll find out over the next hour. But Matt is a musician, producer, songwriter, engineer, entrepreneur, general dude uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, some of his select discography I'm sure so many of our fan base will have heard of, so I'll just read a couple off here for you. Matt has worked on All Time Low, Dirty Work, Nothing Personal, So Wrong It's Right, Panic at the Disco, or Phoebe, Can't Sweat Out, The Main, Can't Start, Won't Stop, Lovely Little Lonely, 303, Under Oath, Good Charlotte, Simple Plan, Taking Back Sunday, a um, ton of people. And also what is really unique and interesting about Matt is that he's also worked with a bunch of pop artists too, like Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato, Kesha, Katy Perry, um, and of course, last but not least, Matt worked on and produced our latest album, All Distortions Are Intentional. Um, so yeah, as you can tell, bit of a beast, been in the game for a long time, worked with so many of our favorite artists, and I'm sure so many of your favorite artists. So without further ado, here is Matt Squire. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? Hey, Seb. This is... Good to see you, man. I was just about to say, this is the part of the interview where we pretend we just haven't been talking for... <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody, and thank you for that intro. That, uh, it was, um, it's, it's, it's nice to be here, and, you know, the, uh, the experience of working with Neck Deep on all distortions changed me, you know, because I'm... A, I'm a little bit sort of messed up now, you know, it was, <laughs> Mess, messed up in what way? Those guys are just, you know, you guys are brutal. You guys are really, you know, really tough on a, a little guy like me who's just trying to like, you know, make my way, you know, just trying to like come yeah. up with good tunes. And you guys are like hazing me and lock me in a closet, Mono Valley and shit like that. And just like no food, no water. I mean, it was, we, we're here to tell the real story, right? I didn't know that's what we were doing. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, good, good, to, good to meet everybody, and um, I'm looking forward to the chat. How, how, how are you doing in these crazy times? We've been, uh, well, this is the thing I, I, I loved about our experience in the, in the studio with you is like, we're friends. Like we, we gen, we all had a genuine connection with each other. And um, I'll, 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 I'll tell the little story, I guess, of how we met, like, uh, like our first encounter. But um, so me, Sam, and Ben had flown out to the U.S. to meet with some potential producers for what is now all distortions. Um, had a couple of weeks lined up in New York and L.A. and we were supposed to meet with a bunch of different people, and then we met squire on day one of that trip and within 15 minutes we were like fuck all right so we're doing the record with squire then the rest, <laughs> of, this, uh, the rest of this trip is kind of pointless but whatever but yeah i think immediately i think within being in the room with you for 15 20 minutes it was like an an instant click yeah uh, yeah it's a vibe and like who knew? You know what I mean? Like I went into the session sort of feeling the same way. You know, obviously everybody hopes you're going to have a connection like that. But like, you know, I sort of went in not knowing and um, and also realizing that you guys had just arrived. So I was like, yo, I'm the jet lag session. You know what I mean? Like, uh oh. <laughs> and like it just ended up being so fun and so cool. And we just connected you know, what I liked about that first session is that it was, we were just as connected musically and having a musical conversation as we were talking about like, just vibes and like things that we notice in the world and, you know, just sort of like, whatever, I think our chemistry applied to all of it. And that's always fun for me. And it ended up permeating in the record. Because like, we, we spent a lot of time making music. And we also spent some time talking about like, crazy stuff you know like talking about space and like just whatever and like that started day one and i just love that uh that it sort of followed us through is that like is that like a common experience you have with like meeting artists or is it 50 50 like do you like what well, i guess what's your what's your kind of philosophy going into those kind of situations where you're meeting a band or an artist or whatever for the first time like is it always awkward or have you got some tricks yeah. You know, it's weird. It's, it's never the same thing. Um, you know, you, you're, you're going in seeking that like spark that we all look for as musicians, which is like, we call it chemistry or inspiration or whatever, but it's the intangible. Like you always go looking to see if you can share a connection to the intangible. Right. And, and so that's, I think a gut thing that we all do. And I do feel like a lot of us get into those meetings or get into that first writing or production session. And I do feel like there is a visceral reaction, just like we have, which is like almost like right away. You're like, there's a vibe here. This feels great. You know what I mean? And if that doesn't happen, it can be tougher. Now it used to be, I would be like, Oh my God, either it's like a amazing connection right out of the gate or it's not, you know what I mean? I used to be very black and white about it. It's not so like I've, I've had other encounters where it like started a little differently or like, you know, somebody was on there like on a different wave or like whatever. And like it ends up pulling together. You end up finding that spark through through the songwriting process or something like that. But the one thing that whether whether it's right out of the gate or whether you whether you find it four hours in. It only works if if I think I, the way I look at it is like you you share a connection to like what you can't really put your finger on like like we were able to like channel something cool like even the first song we worked on together like we we kind of we all sort of just felt like there's a vibe that can't really put our finger on it like feels like it could be like neck deep but it also feels like it could be like the next wave of neck deep and the progression and the growth and you know that's everything that that we all wanted to feel you know what i mean so yeah i think i think it's just it, it's not how you find it but but definitely important to find that spark i i don't know you know there's there's been other artists that i've connected with in, in plenty of different ways i always think of it as a unique connection you know what i mean like i'm obsessed with like i i like think 
people are like fascinating. All different artists are fascinating. So it's like, I always look at my mission as a producer of like, could I have that spark with lots of different people in lots of different ways? Because ultimately like my philosophy is it's like, it's your record, right? So like I should be able to bring out the best in whoever I'm working with. And so it's never going to be the same with different artists and different people. I feel you. It, it, it also felt like you you did have a, like a genuine connection to Neck Deep as well. Like when we came in, like you were like, oh, I like this song on your last record and I like this song on the last record. And like, I feel like that's kind of where we can go to push it. And like, I don't know, set the bar super high for for the rest of our trip of just like, wow, he, he genuinely gave a shit. He knows exactly what we're trying to do. He knows what we need to do. Um, yeah, it felt it, it, but it didn't feel like research either. It didn't feel like, Oh, okay. He's gone on our wiki and done this. Like it felt like you genuinely gave a shit. And then like we, we did some writing in that session too. And it was just super easy. There was no judgment. There was no, no bad vibes. And like, that's another thing about you as well. You're an incredibly positive person. I find like, I don't think, there was there was no low points at this in when we were doing the record ever. It was always very high spirits, and I think you were at the center of that of like making sure morale was high. There was never an idea that was a bad idea. The way we did the record, there was always a ton of amps and percussion and acoustic and always stuff set up to be able to just like jump in and do it. But and I, I don't think that's again, it's it's genuine with you. I don't think you're trying to, oh, I've got to be this positive guy, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, but but we kind of told you about this a little bit before. You've got a degree in psychology, right? Is that, have you got a degree or, or what? Okay, so I have the, I have the degree, okay? But I took a semester off to tour with a band because I was signed to Warner Brothers at the time. So I deferred. So when I graduated, I never walked. So I have a degree, I have a degree but I have no diploma. Okay. So, so, I'm, so I'm a college graduate and a college dropout all at the same time. And it, it depends on, you know, the context, whether I think it's more advantageous to be the dropout or the, the graduate. And mm. I just focus on whichever one works for me on whichever day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I like psych. I like psych a lot. And and it does. It definitely applies to what we do in music. Not that I'm analyzing anybody or pretend to even know how, but more just a fascination. I'm fascinated by like what makes people different from each other and what we all share. But but when we're talking about music, it's what's different. Because I think what what is compelling or like what people want to hear from their bands is like them being the most earnest version of themselves. Like I feel like what we connect with as fans is like realness, you know? Yeah. And and if you can be like um like really uh like let it all hang out there and be genuine that people are going to dig it and like you know from that perspective some of the psych psychology background is helpful and then there's like there's people that I've worked with where like they're not always happy either you know like um I've worked with people who are who have a lot of stresses you know people who are like also actors and like have the pressures of being on TV shows and tight schedules. And like, really when you're trying to slot music into a two and a half an hour block and trying to be creative, like it's tough. And so I, I have trained myself over the years to be like, okay, like the fucking world could be crashing around me, but like these guys need to feel like they can jam, you know what I mean? And so it's, it, it is important I think for producers to understand because dude, everybody's got pro tools. Everybody's got logic. Like most of my bands, like they know what they're doing. Right. I, I kind of like looked at my role as a producer over the years and it has adapted. Right. And it's not just vibes either. Like I'll throw down on pro tools and I'll throw down on logic and we'll collaborate on that stuff too. And we can work intelligently together as people who know the same tools, but left to, everybody's own devices people tend to like over obsess and kind of get like tunnel vision when they're making records and i think a producer needs to be able to like keep it cool and like make it an event every day and make it like you know something where like if you don't feel like you're making something special you might not you know what i mean yeah 
totally that definitely helped in the studio like i already mentioned like it definitely helped in the studio if like there was a low mood or someone wasn't sure of a part you were always like 10 percent happiness and like positivity of like i think it's fucking cool or or whatever you know or even if it wasn't that like i feel like you could talk to everyone i don't know you could it's the way I, I think it was maybe pharrell described the producer it might not be him but like you're a producer is a an essentially just a mirror like you're a mirror for the artist and you're kind of helping them see themselves almost i guess i like that i like that um but yes um, so um one of the one of the big things i wanted to talk to you about um which i'm sure a lot of a lot of bands and artists and tons i, I want to tell everyone about what you've been doing with um remote recording um that was part of the question i was going to pretend like we hadn't spoke for 10 minutes how are you doing how's life? <laughs> but we've been in touch a bunch over the last few weeks and you've been showing us and teaching us like what you've been doing with remote recording and how to do it. So if you could, I say, explain that in layman's terms to people and kind of explain the concept of what it is you've been doing, that'd be awesome. It's actually a little bit of, of a fluke. It's pretty funny. Like, like in 2014, when Apple announced that GarageBand, um, there was like this moment I think it was either the end of 2013 or beginning of 2014 when Apple was like, hey, if you make a beat on your phone on GarageBand, we're now opening up the cloud ability for like you to then open up that session on Logic when you get back to your computer. And I was like, oh my God, like that's amazing. And I got really obsessed with like this concept of we should all be writing online. At that time, it was nifty and everybody was like, wow, we applaud your work. And I like put together this whole platform, like this whole thing, like, and you know, all these connection points for people to like plug in. And like, it just, it just was no real need for something like that at that time. And you've got a bunch of people who are, who are like set in a great method that works already. You're not going to really get a lot of hype on something like that, which I was totally fine with. I was just like, this is my trip. Uh, I get obsessed with these kinds of things and I like engineering, you know what I mean? And we've run out of things to engineer as musicians. So I kind of put it aside for a while. Fast forward to now, you know, a couple months ago, I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, like, yo, like nobody's coming to the studio. Like, you know that, like it's a lockdown and, um, you know, not going to happen. And, um, she she just looked at me and totally nonchalant. She said, yo, why don't you light up your online shit again? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, about I had totally forgotten. I literally had forgotten. So I was I was in the middle of a few projects at the time, and I hit up all those artists. And I was like, yo, would you want to, like, collab? Like, do you want to try and do some online back and forth stuff? And, like, you know, immediately, I think when you say that, people think you're going to be like, on these zoom calls with like terrible audio and like just having this terrible experience and then like you're gonna be drop boxing files back and forth and like oh yeah i'll work on a tuesday and like whatever that's what everybody thinks of as an online collaboration and like that will never do anything for anybody you know people aren't really into that so for me it was more like okay how can we recreate the experience of being in a studio uh but do it over the net and it turns out there's like a lot of tools with which you can use like the most one of the most important of which is this tool splice um which everybody knows like were you already a member so uh, like it's like uh downloading samples and shit and like you can rent plugins i mean it's an amazing service but people don't really know they also have a file sharing service where like i can do i can make a beat and I can cloud it over to Seb and then Seb could work on that beat and it would cloud back over to me and it's automatically saved, which is so amazing. And then like, we can go back in time and go to the different versions. And it's like, I can go back to Seb's first version or my 10th version or whatever. And all of a sudden you've got this thing, this brain in the middle that helps you organize an online collaboration. And that tool right there is so clutch. It's so helpful. Um, 
to be able to like actually have an organizational structure for collabing online. I'd say that was like the biggest first discovery. And that's something that I was using back in 2014 um, that I just, I lit it right back up. They they hadn't even really changed much since then, which is fascinating to me because I, I've, been, I've been trying to give them feedback. It could be a little bit better, so, but yeah. So without, get, without getting into the weeds and like details too much, totally, what, yeah. what are the, some of the tools that you're using to kind of jerry like i know it's a little bit of a jerry rig situation right now as like as it is for most people kind of trying to do this are you still doing audio movers and loop back or, or, or so it keeps evolving because i um i want to know every method uh and just have it all cold and the reason is because every issue that we're having online with recording we had in the studio too and we had those problems and we had solutions for those problems and the best studios don't just have one solution for the problem the best studios have about 18 solutions for the problem whatever whatever comes up you know they want to keep that flow going just like we were talking about like you want to keep musicians feeling creative like if your piano breaks you better have a backup piano if your guitar amp goes out you better have a backup guitar amp like in the beginning of the neck deep album when we kept blowing guitar amp guitar amps it wasn't so much that it's depressing that the guitar amps are blowing but it's it is depressing that you can't work you know what i mean and that's a i was like yo like we need to be able to get a guitar sound right now you know what i mean like it was big for me and so like it's the same thing online you just need to have a few different tools so it, it, it splice is a really important one just because it organizes your shit. It auto backs you up. You can actually, I can actually go and share the screen and run somebody else's logic. And then the files get saved on splice. So the screen share has been a useful tool. There's a plugin by audio movers called listen to that has a send and receive. And that's been a useful tool because it's a, it's a plugin that you put in your DAW, any DAW, and then it will jump the sound out to a website. And so in sessions now online, let's say Seb and I do a session, right? He puts his output to this website. I put my output to that website. And we can actually audition sounds back and forth, which is a big part of the recording studio experience. I can't tell you how many times, a perfect example from, from All Distortions, there's a segue on there, a song on there that was a result of like, we were just messing around on Pro Tools in the studio and, and Ben came in and heard something and was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, I'm just messing around. Like, I'm literally like just messing around. I pressed the wrong button, you know? And he was like, I love it. And he wrote a song over it. And like, that is a big part of the studio experience. So Audio Movers was the first um, breakthrough for me that was like, oh, we can recreate that. And I'll, I'll tell bands now, I'll send them a link. I'll be like, yo, I'm working on your shit. Like, I've got a song that I'm like comping the vocals or melodining or like whatever. And I'll be like, yo, I'm working on your shit. And I'll just send you a link to a website. And I'll be on the shit for like four hours live, like editing. And I will get comments like, yo, that delay throw is so cool. Or like, yo, I hate my vocal. Like, yo, whatever it is. But yeah. it it recreates that feeling. And so that's been a really crucial tool. The, the bottom line is, I guess my advice in this bucket is like, it's difficult. But if you go by the mark of trying to make it feel like the studio experience of trying to recreate that experience, if that's your um, vibe, then you will end up finding a tool. The tools are out there. It's well, the only thing that's been weird is like, me and a lot of my friends are really excited about collaborating online and we're having so much fun and we're busy and we're productive and it's great. I know a lot of people who aren't as well. And it's fascinating to me because I'm like, yo, here's the tools. I keep telling everybody how to do it, but there's like a lack of will. And that's, um, it's concerning to me. Yeah. Why, why, why do you think that is? Is it just, it's too much of a headache and they'd rather wait until they can actually get back in the studio. Cause like, like you say, it's, your your aim was to recreate that feeling of the studio, which is I, which is the most important thing. I think the feeling and the vibe and who's in the room, like you said, like we spoke about this before. It doesn't matter 
what studio you're in or what equipment you've got or anything like that. It's who you're in the room with. And I think, I think you've recreated that. Like we've done a couple of sessions together and it feels good. It feels like it's not super latent and like, like another example, you, you use the like tape analogy of like, there's always going to be latency. It's just like finding ways around doing it. But, but why, 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 why do you think people are resistant to it? Why do you think they're not down to do it? It's a really good question. I, I do know a lot of people who like, quite frankly, like aren't in a good headspace uh, around coronavirus, you know, um, besides the disease aspect of it, there's a whole psychological phenomenon that I'm witnessing that is like really um, alarming. So I have a lot of friends who are like kind of depressed and don't, they, they, they don't admit it, that they, they're sort of, um, they've got it under this layer, this sort of disguise of like a staycation, like yeah. the corona yeah. staycation where it's like, yo man, like I just went out and like, did my hike i did my blah 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 like you know it was great man like i'm i'm gonna i, feel, I think i'm gonna play chess later you know like that, that'd be pretty cool and it's like and i'm sitting there listening to it like being like like no the you're, world stop. You're, yeah you're a fucking musician right and it's gonna be so hard for you on the back end of this it's gonna be so difficult it's gonna be so brutal like even when govs let people congregate again like we're still going to have a lot of trouble touring. You know, bands are not going to be able to pack rooms because you're not going to be allowed to pack rooms. Like everything we knew is in the air. And so you, that's not when you stay Kate. Yeah. When you fucking write songs, like get to fucking work. So that's my vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's, because I've just hit the ground running with that, I've had to take a step back and like go like, hey, not everybody has to feel like me. Not everybody has to hit the ground running and not everybody has to be productive right now. Like some people are really just hurting. I, I, that, that's, my, that's my honest opinion of why people don't do it. The, there's been other things that I think I would characterize as excuses. Like I can't feel it when I do it like that. And I just go, well, you never, you've never, never tried. tried. Yeah. You never tried. And, and, and how can you say it to me with a straight face that like, you don't like how that feels. Like, I know for a fact, 100% that like, you just never even tried to do a session. You just wrote it off as something that wouldn't work for you. Dude, it's amazing. Like, since you've, you've kind of opened that door for us, like, I've been like, okay, I want to try and make this work. And I've been doing some writing sessions and like a bit of pre-pro and demo and stuff. And like, it's fucking sick. It's crazy. Like, fun, right? four or five hours in an evening, like, cool, let's write some stuff. It feels like, okay, they're not physically in the room with me, but it feels like just as much of a productive session in terms of like writing output. The only limitation is like, there is a little bit more of a Jerry rig situation of like, okay, this fucked up. I need to like rejig this a little bit. But in terms of like the vibe and writing, it's there. But the thing is, and this is the funny thing about the duct tape, right? It's like, dude, like, Half the shit in the studio is falling apart at all times, right? Like the studio experience is no different than that. And that's why I say it's good to have a few different solutions because, you know, think about like, so you come up, you come into crazy situations, like the beginning of all distortions, like we didn't know what the hell was going on because every guitar amp we plugged into blew. We blew the power amps in campers. We blew two Marshalls, we blew the 2000, we blew two 800s or one 800, right? Like, and it would be like, not like you turn it on and it blows. It would be like, you turn it on, you play, you play guitar through it for like five minutes and then it blows. And so we're like, what is going on? And so what do we do? We found a workaround. We, we plugged in. We said, hey, we'll take a DI line. We'll reamp this when we get a sound. And it's not the best, but like we'll deal with it because we want to rock, you know? And then we find we find out like two days later, remember the dude from the power company came in? And it was all on, it was all on like a backup Jenny, right? That's what was going on. The dude from the power co company came by and he said, hey, there was a flood here like a week ago. It was when the North flooded. And like, um, we put the whole town on a generator. And so your power is going to be out for about three hours while we turn the grid back on. And we just all looked at each other and went like, Oh, the power has been so unstable that it's been blowing all our amps. 
<laughs> yeah. And so, so that w- that's a huge problem yeah. that we had to find a workaround for. So I just think, I think people made a mistake with computers. I think people thought they were going to do things that, that we couldn't do in real life or like whatever certain, like, I don't know why we have these weird misconceptions about it's, it's, how we're supposed to be on the computer. I guess people have, it's the like instant graphication kind of thing, I guess with like iPhones and social media and stuff. Like, I think we just expect technology to work as we want it to do what I say, computer almost. Whereas like, I, I like the duct tape shit. Like I grew up from like 15, 16 with my older brother, like building computers, fixing computers, reinstalling operating systems, and then uninstalling, doing different ones. So like, I like the tweak and like, I respect that the computer, I, I know why the computer doesn't do things that I want to. And sometimes I don't understand why the computer doesn't do the things that I want it to do, but what the fuck ever. Yeah. And, and then if it doesn't do what you want it to do, because you want to make a great song, you're going to come up, you're going to just solve the problem. You're just going to be like, ah, fuck it. I'll just play it again. Like I can't, I can't get this edit to work. I'll just play it again. Right. And then you'll play it different and it'll be fire. And you'll be like, Oh shit, that was meant to be. And it's like, that's, that's the state of mind that makes great music. And like, I guess like now it's funny because like, I didn't really, I didn't really think that anything I was doing online was like, weird like i just assumed all of us were just figure it out and go right and then i fast forward two months and it's like people are like yo like i like you need to do this thing so people can find out how to do the all the shit and i'm like gladly like i'd be more than happy to give you the tools but mm-hmm. that's not what people need people need the motivation and I'm, I'm just watching it all day long i'm just going like if I figured it out, like I'm not a rocket scientist. I just wanted, I wanted it to work. And I think if you don't, you won't, you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, talking all things amp, amps blowing up and what we, what we assumed were ghosts for the first two or three days. Turn out <laughs> greater issue. Um, we did sage the place though. Uh, yeah, we did. But that yeah, was- well, that was also a little tribute to our homie, you know, because we had like, remember that I was I was staring out the window at Mono Valley where we did the record. And like I watched this poor bird just fly into the studio and fall into a planter. And I was like, oh, man, like, I hope he's OK. But he wasn't. And so I was like, man, what are we going to do for this poor guy? Like, we got to. We got to pay tribute and we got to, this bad mojo. Like, I feel like dead birds, bad omen. I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but like, like dead bird, bad omen. That's like one of my things. This was right before the terror attack in London, by the way. Don't know if there's a connection, probably not. But like, it was like the day before the London bridge attack, the narwhal, that one. Um, So the freaking um, bird, bird dies. I immediately go on amazon.com UK and like order sage to the studio because they don't have any. And it's like, what's a studio with no sage? (laughs) So we, we literally, everybody got, got like into this idea that we had to cleanse the place. And we walked around as a group, which is fascinating to me to this day. I look back into the hindsight and it was like nine of us walking around saging Mono Valley. (laughs) And paying yeah. tribute to our dead homie. That was that was definitely a highlight. I think it worked too. We were good. And like it was one of our rules on the board, wasn't it? We had a we had a huge, like, big do's and don'ts list of the studio or whatever. And one of them was respect the spirits and respect the spirits. And if you have a couch that you don't need anymore, burn it. That's what West did. <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> the bonfire. Uh, <laughs> West muted right now, but he also said another rule was fool the spirits. Oh yeah. Well, so if we paid tribute with the sage, then you're definitely fooling them with the burning couch. They spirits don't know what to do with the with not one burning couch, by the way. Like <laughs> at least it leads to with different materials. And there were many conversations, many like people standing around a bonfire being like. I think couch one burnt better and it's because yeah logical conversations about that i remember that it was crazy that like any like interview i think 
any of us have done about all distortions is a lot of it was the stu like I know we're saying like, it doesn't really matter what studio you're in, which it doesn't, but like being out there secluded in the middle of nowhere with the worst internet in the world, I will <laughs> <clarify>. <laughs> But I definitely think the seclusion the seclusion and the nothing, yeah, just seclusion really helped the record. And also Wes just said in the chat that we're the last band to ever make an album there. It's not not a studio anymore. Last last band to make an album there, which is pretty special too. So so can I just like full circle that, right? Mono Valley, not a studio anymore. We're the last record. Dead bird. Right on. Ooh, fair. I mean, I don't wanna I don't wanna open that can of worms, to be honest, Squire. Not not on this call. The can of worms is open. The portal is open. We hit some fucking inception shit out there in Mono Valley and like poof, no more studio, man. That was sad. I'm still in denial. I still don't believe that. It's like every time somebody tells me Mono's now closed, I'm just like, no, I know they were talking about closing it, but it's really not closed. Like I it's it's crazy to me. That will be crazy to me if it's not there. It was such a it was such an amazing place, such a charmed experience. And and I agree with you about the seclusion. Like we really were focused on the record and you take a bunch of people who like are like in, in, in our normal settings, we have a lot of stuff going on. You know what I mean? There's a lot of distractions, you know, uh, this was a lab, a laboratory, you know, and I, I've never had an experience like that in my life. Like it, it really was a special, like singular experience. And I, I think the laboratory approach was a big part of it definitely definitely felt special and i think that was like the intention going into it we knew that we wanted to go somewhere where we could live essentially um i think with every other record and generally like i think a lot of records are made this way where it's kind of like a block time to be creative like don't get me wrong i think you could like with enough practice and stuff you kind of can turn creativity on yeah. um but i think it was just we wanted 24 7 any time of the day to just record and write music and fully immerse ourselves in making a record rather than being distracted by clubs or food or you know spending money in general or just anything that kind of pulls us out of that headspace almost yeah. for me it was a big teacher you know the record was a lesson for me because i think about like what do we do like what do we do we make music why do we make music like what what is it that we do? Or is it just entertainment? Yeah, it's entertaining. But like, we're trying to make people feel something. We're trying to allow people to feel something. We're trying to give people an outlet, right? That's what this is. And so it, what, what this experience taught me was like, we were able to capture real emotions because people were feeling them. You know, people were genuinely like, had their heads in the album and like, you know, like every word was so important, big, like it, there was just so much like care put into this thing we deliver for, for the fans, because like, I feel like, I feel like fans and people in general need that more than ever. Like they need their musical emotional outlet. And so, you know, for me, the lesson and one of the biggest takeaways was just like, if you're going to try and, get people to feel you got to capture it in the, in the tracks. It, ha it has to, the DNA of that has to actually be in there. And when it is, you can pro tools the fuck out of it. You'll never, if you put it in, it will never leave. The soul will be there, you know? Totally. Totally. You kind of answered like my next question too. I was going to like, it was going to relate to like, what, what was your kind of biggest takeaway from that whole, you know, from the whole, process of making adai or the most memorable but you kind of answered it and that's pretty fucking cool you guys you guys are a really like you guys have a lot of soul for lack of better it's not the best term it's all i can come up with in the moment but like there's a real passion behind what you do and i think i think people could not understand that from the surface sometimes and so, you know, my mission and I and I realized it like my connection point on that first meeting when we talk about that, like instant connection, like like when I first met you guys, I was like, oh, 
wow, holy shit, like right out of the gate, like they care about this. Like they want to get this right. They want to make a really impactful record. Like I just intuited it right away. I was like, holy crap, it's real. Um, so, you know, for me, I was like, what a great opportunity. You know what I mean? Because I really believe that like, that's the magic of music is that we're able to create a visceral emotional connection with people through these weird gadgets that we use and it's more visceral and more emotional than than just talking or or whatever and we don't know how it works so you got to go to a lab you got to find a way to to harness it and capture it when you see it there's so many moments like like low life is such a story of like of like man they were about and and look let's be honest there were there was there was work involved in low life we we weren't sure about certain things we we had to work at it we we it wasn't completely sussed out you know what i mean like we we really had to to find all the magic you know what i mean and like the fact that we did, you know, and the fact that like at a certain point, even those of us who were like, what the hell's going on right now? We're like, holy shit, this song's fire. Like, it was crazy. What a, that was a roller coaster, that song. That was three days of like crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was the, the, the kind of mantra that was like, I felt maybe kept everyone together or like pulling in the right direction was like before we went in to make this record or like one of the mantras i guess was like let's scare ourselves a little bit let's not be afraid to be scared almost like let's just do whatever feels right and do whatever feels good and low life is the prime example of that because the first day of pre-pro there was some like what the fuck are we doing this sounds crazy like this is this is a, a, a left turn or whatever but I think we, I think we realized like we try, did we, did we try and do it like more of like a live jam thing to start with? And then we realized like, okay, let's just produce this. So we start, we started like, I, I guess like, I guess the reason was just because if I remember correctly, we set it up as a live band because the arrangement wasn't done yet. And there was not a fully worked out demo to like rearrange stems. Yep. So we just sort of had this like fantasy that like we could do pre-production the old fashioned way, which it was fun. I mean, we, we did it. We arranged it that way. Did we need to? I don't know, but it was fun. And, and the interesting thing about it is like we recorded those practices and there's like, I'm a little hazy on it, but I'm pretty sure there's like, there's some moments not from them in the song, but there are definitely moments of like people talking and stuff like that, that like are yeah. in the tune that were kind of born out of that energy. The intro of the song is from one of those live takes. Like, right. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. And it's th what a cool thing. Cause it's like, that feels like a band about to play a song. And as opposed to, you hear that on records all the time, right? Where a band goes, hey, I want it to feel like we set up and plugged in and, and counted off. And it always sounds so goofy because they faked it. This one was real, you know what I mean? And so you feel the difference. It's just like, we just set up, you yeah. know? Cool. Totally. So the, yeah, the, the pre-pro and that like old school way of doing it definitely, definitely benefited the song, I think. Even though we were like, okay, we're going to have to record it like, how we've recorded everything else, but that definitely like injected some of the DNA into it for sure. Yeah. We also did, we did everything backwards on that song. We started uh, the rhythm guitars. We recorded with Sam in the, and West in the, um, in the room with feedback, right? Like both of them getting feedback while they were playing or whatever. It was, I, re I remember, I remember the guitars, were noisy before they were like, like I remember like day two of low life being like, yo, we should probably put some real guitars on this because it sounds absolutely crazy. It was like, mm -hmm. I rem yeah, I remember, I remember they were, they were gnarly. They, those guitars are still gnarly. Like, yeah, no, they're in there, but it was, you know, at, at a certain point you come down from like the initial 
buzz of whatever you think is going to work and you actually listen, you know that feeling as a producer, you know this because you do this all the time. Like you have that initial, like, it's almost like a high, like songwriter high. And you're like, wow, this is awesome. And then, you know, day two, you can kind of calm down and listen to the speakers and go, okay, the vision's cool. I need to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, or else it's not going to come to fruition. And, and I think it was too, you know, we always said, trust the process, you know? Uh, and I think that is like a really prime example because we saw it through and there were moments during low life that I think we were like, what the heck is going on? You know what I mean? And, and the fact that we got to the other end of it and it's, and it's such a special song. It's such a cool song and it tells such a cool story. You know what I mean? I'm um, like really had, thankful yeah. for it. It was single one. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and who knew when we started it, nobody would have called that. No, no. Sweet. All right. Well, I've uh, I've got a few questions here from people who've sent some in to me. If you wouldn't mind answering, absolutely. Cool. All right. So, first question I got here is from Todd Edwards. I know Todd. He's a uh, local to me. He's a good dude. Um, on a fever you can't sweat out. How did you work with the amount of keyboard parts they had going and complex layouts of the songs? Were these already written or something you worked on together? Yeah, you know, it was a little of everything. Um, there were about, uh, if I remember correctly, there were about five or six, like, finished demos when we started Fever. Um, and then the rest was figured out during pre-production. And it was like, um, they had, like, a start. You know what I mean? And it would be, or they had a beat or something like that. And so we would build off of that. So the the, the writing was sort of crafted there. The keyboard parts and all the different um, programming elements, that was pretty new to all of us at that time. So a lot of that was in Reason. And what we did is we set up different stations and I would be like tracking guitars on one station. And then I would like turn this way and like Ryan and I would like do some beat stuff on Reason. And then we would like bounce it out and like bring it into the main session it's 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 the exact process we do now it's just that at that time it was pretty it was pretty new but yeah we were just the the answer on fever was that we were just multitasking because we had a very 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 strict deadline on fever that if we didn't meet i'm not sure what would have happened so it was like we got real lucky there deadline deadlines are a good thing deadline was the boss on that one cool uh second question i have here from dylan walsh what are some of the difference with differences working with a big time rush or an ariana grande type artist working versus working with a band like neck deep or have mercy are there differences in energy when the artist is backed by a larger co corporation or an ex exponentially wider fan base yeah it's 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 a it's an interesting question and it's a question i've actually asked myself a lot so it's like really it's it's a great question i've thought about it a lot I don't have a full 100% answer because a lot of it's the same in this cool way where like I didn't expect it to be, you know, where like, like at the end of the day, we're all kind of like looking at vocal comps together being like, did I say that one right? Is this one off time? Like a lot of the process part of it, especially on vocals is, is really similar. Um, I think the difference is that uh, on the, a lot of the pop stuff, I'm playing all the instruments which is weird, you know, that's a different thing. And it put, it was fun. It's, it's, it's more liberating in some ways, but it's also kind of stressful to have to like play everything. So I, I, I like when I, when I work with bands, the, I think the difference is, is really that there's like a sum of all parts, you know, there's like a, a whole brain that is like, could be four or five people together. That's just a really fun energy to be around. You don't, get that same thing necessarily with with pop artists and then there's just this um there's a nice thing for me with bands of being able to be like i love the way you played that play it like this you know and just getting performances out of people i just love that process it's like what i dreamt of doing when i was like you kid wanted to be a producer i always thought that's the producer like captures that so like you know to me 
it feels more natural. But I, I like it all. And the vocal is really very, very similar in, in the vocal respect. I remember asking you maybe a similar question of like, why did you like go to pop and leave pop or, or whatever? And I think one of the things like that was big for you was you and you want to work on like bodies of work. Like you want to do like a record or an EP or whatever. You want to do like a body of work rather than like random singles here and there, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. It, it was, I, I feel like it's more a limitation of mine than, than anything else. Like, like when, when I got to work on all this pop stuff, like I got to be around like all those guys, like Dr. Luke and Max Martin and like all these, you know, people who like are like really, really like at the top of, of that field. So of course me, like as a psychology buff, I'm just like, what's going on here? And, and what I noticed about myself versus them is when I plug into an album that for me is the most enriching experience. That's the one where I feel at home, where I feel like the best stuff's going to come out. And the reason is because you're learning every day about what you're trying to create and you end up having songs come out at the end of the process that were like kind of a, a byproduct of all the time you've spent together. And so some of the biggest songs that I've been a part of came at the end of the process. And that's age old in the music industry. There's U2 stories that are famous about that. Jeff Buckley, like there are stories about these last minute, like Pride in the Name of Love was like a last minute U2 song. And it was like humongous. They wrote it in like 11 minutes or some crazy thing. So I really believe in that. That's where I feel at home. What I was impressed with uh, with a Max Martin or a Dr. Lucas, they could invest themselves in one song in that same way. Like they could immerse in that same way and find all the things that somebody like, like you or I is trying to find uh, in one song, which is like, God bless, amazing to watch. It's absolutely amazing to watch, but I'm not sure. I haven't decided. I'm, I'm young, so I don't know, but I'm not sure if it's me. Like, I just don't know. I, I love albums. So cool. Thank you, man. Um, should we should we get West in the mix? See 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 what chat's saying. If hello, yeah. Hey, hey, Yeah, you know, I, I'm actually not like the expert, like, um, so I can also, I can also consult a friend on this. I have a good friend who's like, he knows this, he's this stuff backwards and forwards, but um, I, I would, I would use maybe like a RE20 or something that's like a EV RE20. I think it's an EV, um, something really passive, like even like a SM7 would be good. Um, just something that's like really not going to color the signal at all. It feels like, like it shouldn't be a hyped, um, mic, you know what I mean? The, uh, the RE20 that it's like that white gray thing. Uh, that's what I always used to use. Also a ribbon, a ribbon could be cool. You know, you can get, you can get these ribbon mics. I think they're made by a company called Studio Electronics. You can get them on Sweetwater. I mean, it's like not that expensive. It's like 150 bucks and they sound great. That's uh, maybe that. I'll ask a friend too. And if I, if I come up with something wildly different, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Awesome. Um, we've got a question here from Blue Stripe 76. How are you coping with the quality of the tracking going back and forth when you're recording online and remotely? Seb obviously okay. knows his stuff, but uh, how would you combat this with another band? Okay, you know, in terms of is the audio comp, do you think is is the audio quality compromised? Is that the? I think so. I think what he means is like obviously Seb is a producer, so he understands what he's doing. But like, if you're working with someone sure. who's thick with music, like me, <laughs> how would you make sure it sounds fine? <laughs> sure thing. Yeah, yeah. So what I usually do is I'll sign on to your computer and I'll just set it up. You know what I mean? So that you don't have to worry about it because it shouldn't be. Like, if you want to write a song with me, I want you to be able to focus on writing the song. If you have to spend the first hour and a half, like, learning how to be a 
studio engineer, you're not going to want to write. You know what I mean? You're just not going to want to do it. And so like my basic deal in a situation like that is I go, okay, surrender control of your computer. I'm going to jump on. Right. And I jump on your computer and I go, go get coffee, you know, go do your thing. Right. And I put all the things that I need onto the session and I set up a, if it's vocals, I set up a vocal sound with like what, you know, I'm, I'm like a, punk rock dude at heart so like i'm not picky i've gotten good sounds out of a 58 you know it doesn't matter what it is we'll we'll get a good sound out of it whatever the best sound i can get out of the gear that the artist has and we'll go from there and you'd be surprised it's like unbelievable like even on an sm7 you know i've had singers track stuff that's great and then also i wanted to clarify per this question on splice if you're sharing the files back and forth the files don't like, like the audio quality doesn't um, degrade when it comes over to my system because the audio file is just a file on the other person's computer. So when it clouds over to me, it clouds as a, as a piece of data, just like Dropbox or whatever. So there's no audio loss with the medium. And the only variables are like, what does the artist have as like a Pro Tools or Logic Rig? What kind of mic? What kind of room? that kind of stuff. And I just try and like go back to my punk rock days and be like, you know, we made it work then we can make it work now. I think the biggest thing with uh, the remote recording is just stable internet. That's the, like, uh, the, uh, you know, a must almost is like you need decent internet. Yeah. It's super helpful. You know, I, I worry about that because everybody like the whole world is on the shit now. So it's like, you know, I definitely worry about that. But so far, knock on wood, it's been good. And like, dude, we've done sessions across the pond and it was fine. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was on Sam's computer. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this can't be. Like, how did they do it? I don't know how they did it. I I, I think I think Zoom's built on AWS. So they must they just must have the high grade shit up there, man. Hmm. Uh, and then we've got one more question here um, from Nick Casaprima. Uh, and he was wondering what the process is to, to reset your brain as a producer going into a new album or with different bands. It's a good question. You know, um, I've gotten really good at compartmentalizing. You know what I mean? And it, it's, it, I don't know. Like, it might be unique to, to, to the way I view production, right? But like a lot of producers... They want to have their sound, right? A lot of my good friends, like, and I, I'm, I'm usually envious of it. I'm like, oh man, like, my, my friend has like his sound, and it always sounds like him, like no matter what, like you always know it's that producer because it's always the same snare, it's always the same guitar, or like whatever. Like my goal as a producer was to not have a sound, was to just bring out the best sounds in the people that I work with. So for me, resetting isn't that difficult just because my standpoint is like, who is in front of me? Let me get the best thing from them, right? And I, I change with every single project. So I can even have four or five projects going on at once. Like, like not, not that I, that's a, a little stressful, but you know, I can have multiple projects, you know, going on and plug in to each one of them relatively easily just because I'm there for the artist. Like they're not there for me. You know what I mean? Like I, my job as a producer is to make sure that they feel good. And so if I take that perspective, I can plug in and out of, of, of anything. It's, it's, uh, might be just, that just might be like the way I view it. I'm not sure if it's correct. Hmm. Sick. Yeah one more i have one more question if that's cool we'll Just wrap a... it up after that i think yeah all good so well this this is a question from me but like oh <laughs> yeah yeah i think it would be valuable for people and i guess it's kind of a long like you could give it a long answer but i guess try and summarize in some way but like my question would be what's one thing that bands can do now in this time or whatever to like push the needle in the right direction so if it's like let's just, like ignoring pandemic for a second i guess if it's like bigger shows or more spotify streams or whatever and i think i might know your answer to this but i'd be interested to hear what you think is one thing a band can do right now yeah you know and first of all there's several right there's a few things that a band can do right now but like the bottom line is is like 
bands need to be doing shit okay like it's not a fucking vacation you know what i mean like in terms of being on lockdown or quarantine or any of that stuff it's like okay like you're not going to be able to tour for a while so like write some tunes or like whatever it is that you can do right now like you need to be doing because it's like there's no there there shouldn't be any more denial and i'm seeing a lot of denial you know what i mean like it's going to be 2 years like for our industry to to function even remotely like normal and it may never function normal again it may just be different so we need to figure out how how can we give those the fans the emotion that we were talking about earlier in this conversation like how can we deliver that like if we captured on the album that's great usually you go and play those songs on tour and it's like a no brainer. You're going to feel the band. You're in the same room. You know what I mean? Like, and that's how tour works and it's amazing. And it's a, it's a transformative experience for everybody involved. We need to be able to do that over the net. And I, and I'm convinced that we can. And I think that there are a few things that bands need to focus on right now that will be helpful for them. One, just because you're on lockdown does not mean that you're a YouTube influencer, okay? If you write songs, write songs, okay? And yes, live stream and yes, YouTube and whatever, but do it for your music, you know what I mean? Find a way to 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 be yourself, right? Because there's a lot of really big YouTube influencers and they're good at what they do. And so it's like you may spend all this time trying to learn that thing and get halfway there and then nothing really comes together and you didn't write and then you're like oh, I got no tunes and I got no inspiration because I got no money and like it can really fall apart really fast you know we all know that and we had to be careful with ourselves right so one is write your fucking face off right that's one and record it two um we need to be thinking about like how can we innovate in the space? You know, like my, my big focus right now is, is how can um, we tie music to gaming, for instance? And this is just one medium, but like, how can we get, um, how can we give listeners a musical experience that they can enjoy while they're playing their favorite game? You know, there was a moment with the Travis Scott Fortnite thing. It's just a fleeting moment. But it was an exciting one. It may be one of the only exciting moments during the last two months in terms of a music industry flashpoint. But like there was a moment where Travis Scott was skinned into Fortnite. My problem with that moment is that it was just one moment. You know, we got to figure out how like how to repeat that. But like, look, we're a very creative community. You know, when we need to figure out a new medium and a new format, and a new paradigm, like we do it. And so I think try stuff, experiment with stuff don't don't over try and don't do things that you think might not work and like wear it out in terms of like your credibility and your cachet with your fan base be very strategic about the things that you do if you're going to do a live stream innovate make it like a crazy live stream you know what i mean if you're going to do a new product release a new song find a way to release it that like that addresses what people are doing right now People are sitting around playing games right now. It's fucking awesome for, for that part of it. You know what I mean? And so it's like, how can we enhance that experience? That's awesome. I feel like I could, um, I feel like that answer could be a good like clickbait title to make people watch all the way to the end. Like bands must hear this advice. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, dude, you know, the, the real shit though, is just get off your fucking ass. You know, I'm seeing a lot of like, I'm seeing a lot of all shucks, world's fucked up. And I'm I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, yeah, it's fucked up. It's the worst time I've ever seen. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about everybody I know, everybody. But I'm writing my fucking face off because I'm writing my fucking face off. That's what I do. That's my job and I can do it. And so many people can't do their jobs right now. And guess what? I can. So I should be grateful for that. And I should, I should celebrate that till three in the morning every night. You know what I mean? Like that was, that was the attitude I took. And look, I could be wrong. I don't know, but that's just the attitude I took. And I think, you know, what could go wrong with that advice for bands? It's like, that's not going to lead you in the wrong direction. hundred percent. Really good advice. And what, what better note to end on? 
That's awesome. awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. This was aw- such an awesome chat. Dude, we, we could do Rogan levels of like three and a half, four hours of this, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Such a great forum and just really a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me to do it. Dude, thank you so much. I'd love to do it again. Absolutely no questions asked. If you're down to do it again, we'll we'll definitely do another one of these. Absolutely. And if if anybody hits if anybody has questions about the text, like the real techie stuff we're talking about, like plugins and shit like that, like you can hit me up. Like I, I'm definitely like down to try and help everybody get get the online thing to be fun. It it really is fun. You're you're experiencing it. Like it's a blast. I'm sitting in in my home studio. I'm just chilling. You know what I mean? Like, it's great. And this is of Matt Squire. This is why we stand Squire. (laughs) (laughs) Guys, well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. Next week, we're going to have Ryan Scott Graham from State Champs on. So look look forward to that. Um, If you want to follow Squire on social media, Twitter is Matt underscore Squire. And Instagram is Matt Squire Music. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Matt Squire Music. At, uh, Matt Squire Music, Instagram. Okay, sweet. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thanks, Squire. And see you guys next week. Take care.